there's the brakes. The brakes are off. And here we go. <laughs> this is my real car and I'm going to show you a bit about it, tell you how I made it, describe some of the systems and how it works and stuff. Let's start off with the frame. So the frame, all, this, all the cross beams, all these ones here, are one inch square steel tubing. There are a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, 15 cross beams. Most of them are floor supports, and you can tell where there is one by line of bolts going across. All these blue side beams here are 2 inch by 2 inch by 1.25 square steel tubing. I welded it all myself, taught myself how to weld. Um, yeah, so next. Next we can go over the drive drive line, drive, drive system. So its engine is from Princess Auto. It's a six and a half horsepower horizontal shaft overhead valve gasoline engine. It's all pretty much self-contained. Um, and then I have a transmission on it, also from Princess Auto. It's called a Comet Torque Converter. Comet Torque Averter. And it's basically like a CVT automatic transmission. It automatically changes gears, starts out in a low gear, and then as you gain speed, it automatically changes gears all by itself up to a higher gear, so you can go faster, because you don't need as much torque. Um, so in in there, on the driven pulley of the, of the CVT, there's a 10 tooth 40 class sprocket. That then gets transmitted through a 40 class roller chain to a 56 tooth 40 class sprocket that's on the drive shaft. That at top speed, the math tells us that we'll have a top speed of 50 kilometers an hour, give or take a little bit, at full speed, fully geared up and everything. The wheels are 15 inch car tire rims. I, I, I would have bought actual rims, actual wheels for rails, but they're like, crazy expensive. A set of four costs $1,700. So that's a bit expensive compared to these ones, which were like $5 each. And the flange is big enough to, to work on railroads. And if it doesn't, then I'll just move it so that the rail goes in here. Uh, I have it set up right now so that the rail rides on this part here. And then this is the flange that keeps it from moving. The drive shaft is one inch, um, one inch drive sh key drive shafting from Princess Auto. Um, how, how the wheels are attached is, let me just get a better light here, is here's the drive shaft, and then there's a hub. The hub has a one inch keyed hole in it, and then that go that I welded onto a five on four and a half bolt plate. This is like a thick disc with a hole in the middle and then five bolt holes on it. The hole in the middle is, is a, called a W, class hole and then that fits on a W class hub which is this so you buy the so you buy the bolt thing to, the, to fit the bolt pattern on your wheels you then weld that to the hub and you get the hub that matches the size of your drive shafting so I welded the plate to the hub and then locked that onto the drive shaft um, the bearings are one inch Y class pillow block bearings they, they're locked onto the drive shaft with an eccentric locking collar. So that's the wheels. These plates up here on both sides, they're angled out relative to the rail car. And that is what is called a pilot or a rail guard or a lifeguard. And it knocks things off the rails that would otherwise derail the rail car, like stones or twigs or anything that might be on there it'll knock them off and keep this from being derailed. Um, the next thing we can go over is all the seats and stuff. So I originally had these ones here from Princess Auto. Got them on sale for $25 each because they're discontinued. 
Um, and they were working great, because normally boat seats, the cheapest ones are $50 each. Then, uh, a couple months ago, I went into Bass Pro Shops to get the battery, and I saw these seats on sale, $25 each. Same price, much better seat. So I bought three of them, still kept them, because $25 a boat seat is still an amazing price, so I'll use them maybe for something else. Um, and they are attached to the frame on a five inch square locking, rotating, locking swivel plate. So I'll just put the camera down and show you what that means. So there's a lever here that fits into 12 positions on the bottom. Pull out the lever, that releases the tooth and you can swivel the chair in 360 degrees. That way, you can go sideways like that, in, or if we wanted to, we could turn it around and push it backwards or sit backwards or do whatever we wanted to with it. The seat belts I bought off eBay. They're great seat belts. Just like a car, it's a two point lap belt, adjustable. And what's really neat about them, which I didn't know I didn't know about them when I bought them, is they have this little little clip right here that holds the excess webbing here onto the belt so it's not flopping all around and that, that's great because then it won't get caught under the wheels or get tangled in anything and either pull the rider out or derail it or do some other thing that we don't want so that's nice. Uh, the seats can fold down and because they're boat seats they're designed to be outside so don't have to worry about anything like that. Next thing that we'll go over, the biggest thing is the air system. Or actually, you know what, we'll go over painting it and how I built it and stuff. So, first, first had the idea to build this about two and a half years ago in October of 2011. Uh, my dad and I were going along railroad tracks with my garden tractor collecting glass insulators. It was very slow, very bumpy, and by the time we got home, I, ha I, I was thinking, okay, there has to be a better way to do this. So I started drawing up designs, really, really simple plans, like two seats, uh, very, very small, just light and quick, just something that we could put together easily. Um, so I started putting together plans, we went to Princess Auto, saw what they had to offer, started drawing up more plans, and just kind of, just kind of thought, okay, that might be something neat to do one day. Then, I kept thinking about it, kept thinking about it, and thought, okay, I might be actually able to do this. So I started drawing up more plans, laying out parts, trying to get an idea of what this thing would look like, and eventually came up with this design, three-seater, drive shaft in the front configuration that you see here. This actual design, I did not draw any plans for, did not do any calculate. I didn't draw anything up. The only plans I had were in my head for this. The only plans I drew up were for basic two-seater things like, 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 um, I got itty bitty go-kart for railroad tracks, so I built this entirely from plans in my head. So I got the parts, started building up parts, and then and then got advice to maybe use this as special projects for school. So what I did was I bought all the parts, started putting them together, finalized the plans and everything, and then I started building during the school year so that I could get credit for it. I got five credits for building this, and five credits toward my diploma. And so I started welding it once I had finalized the plans. Once that was all done, I had to paint it. So I had to, I had to grind it down with something called a flat disc, and that is that is a wheel for an angle grinder and it has little little squares of sandpaper all around it. That gets rid of all the scale and bits of rust and stuff that's on the metal to make sure that the paint has good adhesion. Then you wipe it with solvent. That gets rid of all the oil and dirt and everything, so it's just bare metal. Um, I then painted it with two coats of flat gray metal primer, Princess Auto, and while that was dry, I painted it in the color scheme you see here with two coats of high gloss tractor and implement enamel paint. Uh, black with blue trim. The floor is three-quarter inch G1S plywood. 
Um, I primed it with two coats of Kills 2 Latex, and then the top coat is flat black exterior paint. On the top, I mixed in with the paint Grit Additive. It's by Rust-Oleum. Mix it in with the paint and it makes it kind of rough. Rough. It makes it a rough texture so it's not all slippery, so it's easier. If you don't slip on it, so it's easier to get a grip on it. Especially when it's wet. Uh, then was that. Then when that was done, bolted everything on. Yeah. So, next we'll go over the air system. This is pretty much the, the biggest, most elaborate system that I have on here. Uh, it's designed to be fully modular and fully self-contained. So first, got a battery here. Group 29 deep cycle battery. That means that you can drain it almost, almost dead and bring it up again and it won't hurt it. Nice thick lead plates. That gets, the power from that gets routed to this 1000 watt inverter from Princess Auto. That brings the 12 volts from the battery up to 120 volts AC, just like to plug it in from the house socket. That will then power this compressor here. Compressor will charge up its tank and then go through a quick connect system to this valve here. This valve is a quarter inch ball valve with a male M-type uh, air plug on it. That just gets plugged into here. And then you can turn on and off the system. So when you turn this on, it charges the system. So I'll just turn that off for now. So, that then goes through this whip hose to our first stop here, which is an oil and water separator. This had the white collar in there has a very specific filter size that blocks out water and oil and everything and it gets contained in, in the jar here and then every once in a while you drain it out. Then I have a quick connect a T and then a female coupler M type air hose connection. So then with this you can plug in a an M type plug an M-type plug and you can use air tools off of it. Then it goes to a filter. Same thing, you can drain the water out of it. Then to a desiccant dryer. There's little beads of silica gel in here and that absorbs every little last bit of water in the air and you'd be surprised how much water there is in compressed air. Then you get to another T fitting and another ball valve. This gets followed back all the way under here and up to here. Here we have a right angle pneumatic hose fitting onto a male M-type air plug. That gets connected into there. And this is the big reservoir air tank for the air horns. So it gets charged through here and then this gets charged up to 100 PSI. It then goes through a half inch airline to another ball valve. And I designed this to be completely modular so you can move it all around, interchange parts, and you can interchange anything with anything and it'll still connect. So I did that with these threaded unions. Just do that, and then you have the female and the male right there, and then you can interchange that with any, any other part in the system. So you can omit this hose, put the valve right there, do anything you want and it'll still work. That then gets piped through this hose up to the engineer's seat where it gets to another modular fitting, pressure gauge, and then this special valve. This valve was $40 at Akron's Granger. It's a half inch valve, half inch ball valve, and what's special about it is that it's spring loaded. So it springs back to the closed position. So I open it then it just closes. That's so that is that that mimics a real train horn valve. And train horns, yes. Right over there. So another quick connect fitting. When you open that valve, it pressurizes this line, this half-inch threaded line. Another quick connect fitting. This would be connected onto here. And then gets piped to this manifold here. 
These are PVC train horns I made from plans designed by Dozer Boy Miller. You can search for him on YouTube and his plans are available on eBay. There's five chimes here and I tuned them to be exactly like a real train horn. The specific chord is the Leslie S5 chord um, and they're very loud. So yeah. These are the, the diaphragms are polycar uh, polycarbonate, Lexan. So what's really neat about them is you can look right through them. <laughs> you can look through them. It's pretty neat. In the tubes here, there are uh, 22 gauge, 22 American wire gauge butt connectors for wires. And what that does is it meters the air, because inside there's a little eighth inch hole and that makes the air go through just enough that they sound and are good and loud, but that you don't waste air. Because we have an unlimited supply because there's a battery and a compressor, but it takes a little while to charge up with that little compressor. So you don't want to waste any air. And I'll probably find it, I'll, I'll have to find another place for these horns, maybe further back or up on something, because on the, on the abandoned line there's tons of weeds and everything. So if these are sitting out here like this, and you're going forward, they're gonna get bashed up pretty good hitting, hitting weeds. So back to back to the TV over here. So instead of going to charge the horn reservoir, you can go through this regulator here. Regulator is set for 60 psi. I'll just charge it again. So that's set for 60. And the reason it's set for 60 is because that's I figured that out through math to be the perfect pressure for something that I'll tell you in just something I'll show you in just a second. That then gets piped another shutoff valve and through a pneumatic speed controller valve. This is a very very precise needle valve for controlling how much air goes through the system, and the end final result of that is how quick the brakes are applied. So this pneumatic hose is piped through here, under here, under the engine, and into this rotary three position four way, no, three position four way valve. It is the brake valve. So the pressurized air coming at 60 psi comes in through here. That then goes through here. Here's neutral, applied, neutral, release. Neutral locks both air supplies, so you can do it for a little bit and apply and back, and it stays in that applied position without being pulled off or back on. If you want to release them, release back to neutral. So it comes in through here comes in through here and then here's the here's the apply gauge and this pressure gauge pretty much tells us how much are the brakes on 60 is emergency brakes 40 is the maximum service brake and anything below that is just however you, however fast you want to stop so that then gets piped to this hose the release pressure goes to this hose get that gets piped through those two hoses underneath this bar here. They both hit elbows and come on over to this cylinder here. This is a 40 millimeter bore, 100 millimeter stroke pneumatic cylinder from Princess Auto. It's the brake cylinder. To mount it, I got these two brackets from Princess Auto and custom machined this bottom one here so that it could go almost 90 degrees so I could get the proper thing I want and that's just screwing it onto the floor with some um, some more wood underneath to give it some more strength. So when you want to apply the brakes, air comes in through here and pushes the piston out. That then moves this lever, which then through another lever system, squeezes the brake disc with the caliper. That then that slows down the rail car because it's because the brake disc connected directly to the drive shaft. When you want to release the brakes. Um, air comes through this one, pushes the cylinder back. So I'll just pressurize the system again. And 
you'll hear a bit of hissing right there. That's because there's a leak right there. I just need to reseal it with some more pipe sealant and be fixed. So when you turn on the brakes, just a second, when you turn on the brakes, you'll see that this pressure gauge goes up. But when you pull the brakes to apply, air goes from here into this hose here through the valve mechanism in here. That then gets piped over to here and pushes the cylinder out. When you release the brakes, it goes back and lets go of the brake disc. So you want to just go a bit, then there you go. So release, neutral, apply, neutral, release. That's the air braking system. So the air, if we go to apply, what the air does is it goes from here, through the mechanism in the valve, out through here. It then goes into here and pressurizes behind the disc in the cylinder, behind the piston in the cylinder. The air in front of the cylinder, while the piston moves out, comes back out through this hose, back out through that line, in through here, in through here, and then it's routed out through here. This is the exhaust port, and then the little brass thing I have in there is called a muffler and it's centered bronze, so it's, it's like a paper filter, but it's made of bronze. It makes the air coming out a lot quieter than it would be, otherwise it'd be very, very loud when the air rushed out of there. Very loud. So, so when, when you release the brakes, air rushes in here and pressurizes in front of the cylinder, pushing the piston back. The air that was behind the cylinder when it moved back gets pushed out of here and goes out the exhaust port. The opposite happens when you apply the brakes. So this valve controls where this pressurized air goes. This one or this one, apply or release. When it's in neutral, all the ports are blocked and it keeps it in its position, keeping the pressure in it. This, this swivel trailer jack back here, uh, this is what I'll use to turn it around because it has no steering because when you're on railroad tracks the tracks do the steering for you, you don't need steering and it'd be a bit complicated to add just to be able to turn it around so this, pull that out and it swivels up just a second swivels up locks in place that then can jack up the back of the rail car so that the back wheels are off the ground. That means, because it swivels, that you can pull it and turn it and rotate it around whenever you need to to make it go back the other way on the railroad tracks. And then when you're back on the tracks, bring it down. Pull that out to release it, and it just folds down. Nice and neat for transport. The entire rail car, the frame, is nine feet long and four feet wide. The overall length is nine and a half feet wide, and the overall width is about five and a half feet wide. And this trailer jack, the other night, I wanted to test it to make sure that when we brought it out there to use it, that it didn't just fall apart or that we couldn't turn it around after all. I wanted to make sure that it would actually work. So it was originally held on with these brackets here. And once this focuses, and how these worked is they were on one side and then bolts went through here and here bolts went through here and here and then clamped the bar here between this clamp between this clamp and the, the jack there. What happened was is I jacked it up and was gonna turn it around but then as soon as I started moving it this bent just like plastic like I hardly I hardly touched it and it just bent and this is like thick steel so I had to make new I had to make new brackets out of the same stuff, this is that same one by one by 1.2 inch square steel tubing 
just drilled holes in them, cut them to length, bolt them on with an impact wrench. So that took care of that, now it's good and strong, doesn't budge a bit. All the bolts are what are called grade 8 bolts. That, that refers to the strength of the material that they're made of, the tensile strength, that's pulling strength. Uh, normal bolts, like the normal silver ones that you see, are usually grade 5 bolts. Grade 8 is much stronger, and the reason that the bolts and nuts are gold in color is because they're coated with a chemical called zinc chromate. That's a very powerful anti-rusting chemical. Uh, normal bolts are silver, and that means that they're coated in zinc, normal zinc. That's still good for keeping rust away, but zinc chromate's much better. So, for the little bit more that you pay for grade 8 bolts, you, you get your money's worth, because then you don't have to worry about stripping it by tightening it too hard, and you also get the added bonus of zinc chromate for rust proofing. So that's about it, that's all that I can think of for now. If you guys, if you think I missed something, or you want me to t explain about something, go ahead and ask. Um, so this is Thunderbird 7, my rail car. It'll be used on abandoned railroad tracks just east of Calgary. And its main purpose will be collecting telegraph insulators and zooming on the tracks and having some fun. Thanks for watching, bye. So uh, this is charged up to 125 PSI. It's connected through a hose to this 10 gallon tank um, through this hose. Then it hits a, a, hits a valve here, and then this is the modular fitting. This is the same valve that's on the rail car, and then it just comes apart in pieces like that. So, and that's what I mean by modular. So then there's another fitting here, and then it goes to a little short hose, and then over to the horns. And then this valve is spring-loaded to go back to the closed position.